<laughs> welcome everyone. <laughs> welcome everyone. Um, I am so happy to see faces in a room in person after all this time. Uh, this is our very first Humanity Center event. Uh, in public uh, in, well, I don't know, close to three years, two and a half years. Um, and so it's really a delight to see all of you. Um, and of course, to welcome all of you who are participating over Zoom as well. Uh, and it's great that we have this ability to um, do both things at once. Um, and so I just, I'm Denise Davidson. I'm the director of the Humanity Center. And I just want to say a couple welcoming remarks, uh, thank a few people, and then I will let others take over from there. Um, so first of all, I want to thank our sponsors. We received a generous grant from Georgia Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, we received money from them that comes from the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 to relaunch our public programming and make it possible to do these hybrid events uh, to, to pay the staff and so on that are helping us do that. And while I mentioned the staff, I should thank um, Michael Swanson, who has been sitting at the front desk welcoming you as you arrive and will be taking some pictures and Torres Wilson, who's helping us behind the scenes uh, doing his Zoom magic. So thank you, both of you. Um, and I wanna mention for those of you who are participating over Zoom, um, that if you use the QR code that's on the screen, um, you have access to both the agenda for today's event and a space where you can pose questions. Um, and so following the lecture, uh, we'll, we'll have a Q&A session and both people in the room and people participating over Zoom are welcome to pose questions at that point. And now very quickly, let me introduce the person who will be introducing our speaker. Um, Jenny Burnett is director of the Institute for Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies and an associate professor of anthropology. Um, she works on Rwanda and the Rwandan genocide and has a forthcoming book, um, which is entitled To Save Heaven and Earth, Rescue in the Rwandan Genocide. Jenny, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Davidson, and thank you to everyone who came and those of you attending online. Um, it's my great honor to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Yelena Svodic, Professor of Political Science here at Georgia State University. When I first arrived at Georgia State in 15, 2015, um, it's been my great privilege since then to get to know Dr. Svodic and to collaborate with her um, on several symposia. Dr. Svodic, Sabotich writes about international relations theory, politics, human rights, transitional justice, international ethics, state identity, and the politics of, West, of the Western Balkans. In 2021, she was honored as an outstanding senior faculty member in the Georgia State College of Arts and Sciences. Her first book, Hijack Justice, examined the ways uh, the examine the contested way in which international norms of transitional justice were appropriated by domestic political elites in the Western Balkans and the aftermath of the Yugoslav Wars. Tonight, she will be speaking on her most recent book, Yellow Star, Red Star, Holocaust Remembrance After Communism, which was published by Cornell University Press in 2019. The book has received numerous awards, including the Robert Jervis and Paul Schroeder Best Book Award from the American Political Science Association, Best Book Award in European Politics and Society from the European Politics and Society section of the American Political Science Association, and the Joseph Rothschild Prize in Nationalism and Ethnic Studies. The, books ex the book explains how, after the collapse of communism, East European countries pursued access to the European Union and engaged in Europeanization. In this process, these countries confronted the Western European narrative of the Holocaust as a defining event of 20th century European memory. In response, Eastern European nations adopted new strategies of Holocaust remembrance, where the memory symbols, symbols and imagery of the Holocaust became appropriated to represent crimes of communism. Most importantly, in the book, Dr. Sabotich points to the nefarious ways this imagery plays into rising waves of anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe. Not only does the book highlight significant transnational processes in Eastern Europe, it also provokes the reader to consider the ways that public memory of and monuments about contested pasts are shaped by politics and in turn shape politics. And uh, I would add, I think, readers in the United States have much to learn from this book. So without further ado, Dr. Sabanich. 
Uh, thank you for these uh, wonderful introductions. I mean, it's really nice to be to be in person. I'm uh, very very tired of virtual living, so this is this is excellent. All right. There we go. All right. So in 2014, I visited my hometown of Belgrade, Serbia, and I went to see an exhibition at the Serbian Historical Museum. The exhibition was called In the Name of the People, Political Repression in Serbia After World War II. And the exhibition promised to display new historical documents and evidence of various crimes, such as assassinations, kidnappings, detentions and camps of the Yugoslav communist regime after 1945. As I walked through the exhibit, I stopped in my tracks. I recognized the photograph, the one on the left. In the Belgrade exhibition, this image was displayed in the section devoted to the communist era camp for political prisoners on the Adriatic island of Goli Otok in today's Croatia. The exhibition describes the photograph as the example of living conditions of Goli Otok prisoners. But I knew the photograph was not it. In front of me, on the right, was a well-known photograph of prisoners from the Nazi Buchenwald concentration camp, including Elie Wiesel, who you can see the picture, taken at Buchenwald liberation in April 1945. It is one of the most well-known photographs of the Holocaust. So I went home, called a couple of historian friends who assured me that complaints had already been lodged with a museum and that the display was about to be corrected. Sometime thereafter, in response to an outcry from Holocaust historians, a small note was taped underneath the display caption that read, a photograph of prisoner boxed beds in Dachau camp. Now that nobody bothered to check that a photograph was in fact from Buchenwald and not from Dachau, is symptomatic of the broad irrelevance with which the Holocaust is met in Serbia. But what I took from this exhibition was not only the indifference and carelessness when dealing with the Holocaust, but more fundamentally the attempt to equate communism and fascism and in doing so, appropriate Holocaust remembrance and imagery to delegitimize communism. And this is hardly an indigenous Serbian invention. In Hungary, here's the House of Terror, which goes out of its way to bring home the message that fascism and communism were flip sides of the same coin. There are multiple visual representations of black totalitarianism and red totalitarianism, of the black arrow cross and the red star of the fascist uniform and the communist uniform. In addition to equating fascism and communism in doing so with blunt force, many of these museums and memorials have also begun depicting their entire nation states as victims of foreign regimes. That's completely ignoring both the actual lived experience of various victims of these regimes but also, and more importantly for my purposes here, completely erasing any discussion of local complicity for any historical crimes, be they crimes of the Holocaust or crimes of the Gulag. For example, the House of Terror Museum in Budapest narrates the story of Hungary's 20th century experience as a nation victim of the foreign communist regime. In this museum's exposition, the fascist era begins with the German occupation in 1944 and not in 1940 when Hungary joined the Axis Alliance. This shift therefore completely removes the history of the Holocaust in Hungary before 1944, the period that left 60,000 Hungarian Jews killed as early as 1942, the extermination carried out not by Germans, but by Hungarian forces under the rule of Regent Miklos Horthy. Similarly, the memorial to the victims of the German occupation erected in 2014 in Budapest memorializes Hungary, the country, as the main victim of the German occupation. 
by a not very subtle depiction of Germany's imperial ego crushing of Hungary, which is symbolized by Archangel Gabriel. But note the deep domestic contestation at the bottom of the picture this memorial has produced. These are handwritten notes and pictures left by Holocaust survivors or their family members that want to tell the story of 430,000 Jews who were deported from Hungary, mostly to Auschwitz, the quickest rate of deportation in the history of the Holocaust, taking less than two months and done with the active participation of Hungarian civil servants. And in Vilnius, Lithuania, the top tourist destination is the Museum of Victims of Genocide. But in a country that was ground zero for the Holocaust, where 95% of pre-war Jewish population was exterminated, the highest number of any occupied country anywhere in Europe. This is not the museum to those victims of that genocide. It is a museum to the victims of the Soviet occupation that in Lithuania is considered the real genocide. And yet, this remembrance of the 20th century is not exactly Holocaust denial. Viktor Orban even declared 2014 a year of Holocaust commemoration. However problematic, it does not prominently feature voices that deny the Holocaust as a historical fact, nor challenge its most established realities. It is also not quite the same as trivialization. While the emphasis always is on the larger ethnic groups, the Poles, the Hungarians, the Lithuanians suffering, it is relatively rare to hear outright belittling of Jewish victimization. A more nuanced way of understanding this type of Holocaust remembrance, I suggest, is this memory appropriation, where the memory of the Holocaust is used to memorialize a different kind of suffering, such as suffering under communism or suffering from ethnic violence perpetrated by other groups. It is Holocaust remembrance turned inward, and away from the actual victims of the Holocaust or the Holocaust itself and into what Polish historian Ewa Plonowska Zjarek calls the narcissistic identification with Jewish suffering. But why does all this still matter? After all, Holocaust revisionism is not new and it's not particularly surprising and has certainly led to much revisionism in the West. And here is what I respond. My principal argument is that post-communist states today are dealing with conflicting sources of insecurity. They are anxious to be perceived as fully European by core Western European states, a status that remains fleeting. Being fully European, however, means sharing in the cosmopolitan European narratives of the 20th century, perhaps the strongest being the narrative of the Holocaust. But this was not always the case. What we today refer to as the Holocaust did not exist as a concept or as a marker in global collective memory prior to the early 1960s. Holocaust memory has developed over time and has gone through various phases in various countries and over various periods. In the West, what we today would recognize as the narrative of the Holocaust emerged with a series of important trials in the 1960s primarily of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem, and then the Auschwitz trials in Frankfurt, as well as a series of popular cultural events. For example, the American TV show, The Holocaust in the late 1970s, and especially the Schindler's List in 1993, which placed Jewish suffering at the center of the Holocaust narrative and presented a visual and symbolic repertoire of how we think the Holocaust looked like repertoire which remained mostly stable until today. But the Soviet dominated East placed events of World War II within a larger narrative of communist revolutionary triumph and anti-fascist heroism. Communist memory was hegemonic memory, not open to alternative or particular claims on suffering, such as the suffering of the Jews. In communist Eastern Europe, Holocaust remembrance was exclusively produced through the framework of anti-fascism because this link established the communist regime with its new post-war identity and provided it with ongoing political legitimacy. These two ways of remembering East and West 
diverged almost immediately after the war and developed in quite different directions throughout the post-war period. And it is at the point of contact after the end of communism in 1991 that these two ways of remembering began to cross paths. Almost immediately, the European narrative of the Holocaust created stress and resentment in post-communist states, which have been asked to accept and contribute to this primarily Western European account as members or candidate states of the European Union and NATO. The problem is that the cosmopolitan Holocaust memory as developed in the West did not narratively fit with a very different set of Holocaust memories in post-communist Europe. This lack of fit was evident primarily in the lack of centrality of the Shah as the defining memory of the 20th century experience across the post-communist space. As Tony Judd put it, quote, the really uncomfortable truth about World War II was that what happened to the Jews between 1939 and 1945 was not nearly as important to most of the protagonists as later sensibilities might wish, end quote. Instead of the memory of the Holocaust, Eastern European states after communism constructed their national identities from the memory of Stalinism and Soviet occupation, as well as pre-communist ethnic conflict with other states. The European centrality of the Holocaust then replaced the centrality of communist and ethnic victimization as the dominant organizing narrative of post-communist states, and it was therefore threatening and destabilizing to these state identities. And so in this book, I document how influencing European Union's own memory politic, politics and legislation in the process, post-communist states have attempted to resolve these insecurities by putting forward a new kind of Holocaust remembrance where the memory, symbols, and imagery of the Holocaust become appropriated to represent crimes of communism instead. The criminal past is not fully denied, but the responsibility for it is misdirected. And this accomplishes two things. It absolves the nation from acknowledging responsibility for its criminal past, while at the same time, it makes communism as a political project criminal. But I want to make two additional important points here. The centrality of the Holocaust as a foundational European narrative is also soundly rejected across post-communist Europe because of its perceived elevation of Jewish victimhood above victimhood of other regional majority ethnic groups, a move that is increasingly openly resented. In the absence of almost any Jews across vast swaths of the East, post-communist national identities were built first on a rejection of the communist pan-national identity project where the organizing narrative is loyalty to the socialist and not the ethnic subject. And instead on ethnic majoritarian, majoritarian and therefore very homogeneous basis that leaves almost no room for incorporation of minority members. Holocaust remembrance therefore challenges the security of a nation's identity because it problematizes the very biography on which this identity was constructed. Further, the European Holocaust memory's focus on Jewish suffering is also rejected in much of post-communist Europe because it brings about discussion about extensive and deep local complicity in the Holocaust and material and political benefits of the complete Jewish absence across Eastern Europe. Jewish businesses, homes, and property have over decades of looting followed by communist seizures slowly morphed into the general economy with difficult and sporadic attempts at restitution. The fact that post-World War II Jewish communities in these countries are negligible in numbers and have limited political clout is not incidental to this narrative. Once multicultural societies with large Jewish minorities are now mostly ethnically homogeneous. This very fact of post-war ethnic homogeneity is a problem anthropologist Michael Hertzfeld called cultural intimacy an issue of domestic identity building, the thing that builds the nation together, but simultaneously an issue of international embarrassment and sometimes even shame. And this is why much of Eastern Europe 
is a purposeful site of non-memory, a site of dismembered multi-ethnicity, a landscape of Eurasia. So next, I want to demonstrate that a way out of this condition of what I call ontological insecurity, which is insecurity about your own identity, for post-communist states was to connect the undesirable remembrance of the Holocaust with a more desirable remembrance of communism and its crimes. The consequences of this move was a new inverted memory of the Holocaust, where the crimes of fascism came to be represented as crimes of communism. Post-communist European states first encountered the European push for a unified cosmopolitan memory of the Holocaust as they tried to join various European organizations after 1991, foremost in their application for a European Union membership, but also membership in other European institutions, such as, for example, the Council of Europe. A major European institutional push was the Stockholm Forum on the Holocaust in January 2000, convened by Sweden to define a common framework for European Holocaust remembrance research and education. <laughs> The forum established the International Task Force on Holocaust Education, Remembrance and Research, which has since been renamed into the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, or ICRA, which is more common and more in the news, which remains the most explicit international organization that constructs, institutionalizes, and diffuses transnational Holocaust memory in Europe. In 2005, the European Parliament adopted its most complete resolution on the Holocaust, which established 27 January, the day of liberation of Auschwitz in 1945 by the Soviet Red Army, as the European Holocaust Memorial Day across the whole of the EU. And while post-communist states accepted this new regulation, signed documents, and adopted major parameters of the memory framework, not wanting to jeopardize the delicate process of EU accession, once they were safely in the EU, the new Europeans demanded a thorough renegotiation of European memory politics, one that denies the Holocaust its centrality for post-war European memory, and instead places it on par with the other major totalitarianism of the 20th century, communism. Significantly, East European states forged alliances with the Western European right most directly the European People's Party in the European Parliament, in pushing for EU resolutions and proclamations that would decentralize the Holocaust from pan-European memory and add crimes of Stalinism as its equal. This push to commemorate side by side the two 20th century totalitarianisms culminated in two European Union documents. The 2008 Declaration on the Proclamation of 23rd of August as the European Day of Remembrance for Victims of Stalinism and Nazism, and the Resolution on European Conscience and Totalitarianism, which built on the 2008 Declaration of the same name. And this is the poster of the Declaration. <laughs> the Prague Declaration is perhaps the most explicit document that lays out the ideological framework post-communist European states have used regarding the place of the Holocaust and communist memory. Well, the declaration's first article states that, quote, both the Nazi and communist totalitarian regimes should each be judged by their own terrible merits, end quote. The declaration then goes on to make this claim, quote, exterminating and deporting whole nations and groups of population were indivisible parts of the ideologies they availed themselves with, end quote, which explicitly equated the specifically genocidal aspect of Nazism, extermination of whole nations, and attributed it to communism. The rhetorical move of referring to communist crimes instead of Stalinist crimes is critical here because it implies the terror was communism's central organizing feature, which then makes it easily narratively equated with fascism. And indeed, this equation of the two regimes as being structurally the same even led one European member of parliament to declare, quote, I asked the European parliament to stand in solidarity with the victims of fascist communism, end quote. 
And please also note that the official banner of the Prague Declaration movement wants to prohibit the hammer and the sickle, not the swastika. Mm -hmm. I now want to further illustrate these arguments with some examples of contemporary Holocaust remembrance practices in Croatia, the newest EU member, and point to specific ways in which state power was used to discipline and organize political memory. Croatia's memory of the Holocaust is the source of severe state anxiety. Croatia's relationship with the Holocaust is deep, broad, and incredibly contentious. During World War II, Croatia declared an independent state, a Nazi puppet statelet governed by the homegrown fascist movement, the Ustasha. The Ustasha implemented fascist racial laws in large part autonomously and sometimes even more brutally than the German Reich. Anti-Jewish laws, Aryanization of Jewish property, followed by the deportation and extermination of Croatia's Jews, were carried out with great speed and efficiency, earning much praise from Berlin. Significantly, however, the Ustasha were not interested only in the annihilation of Croatian Jews. The central part of their project was also the full-scale destruction of Croatia's large Serb <clears throat> and smaller Roma minorities. Across a vast network of Croatian concentration and extermination camps, the largest of which was Jasenovac, which I'll talk more about in a minute, as well as through summary executions across the country and deportations to other Nazi camps, some 32,000 or 80% of Croatian Jews, <clears throat> some 300,000 or 17% of Croatian Serbs, and almost all Croatian Roma, some 25,000 people were killed between 1941 and 45. This unusable past presented a serious problem for the new Croatia, which emerged an independent state out of the rubble of the former Yugoslavia in 1991. In constructing its post-Yugoslav identity, the new Croatia needed to sidestep the communist past as a legitimate period of the country's history and institute a clear historical connection with a pre-communist state as an inspirational model for contemporary manifestations of ethnic statehood, thus stabilizing Croatia's state identity through time. The problem, however, was that the only modern independent Croatia the new state could go back to and root its new statehood in was the World War II fascist Croatian state and all the memory baggage it brought with it. And so as part of this memory replacement, Croatia embarked on a hurricane of World War II monument destruction in an attempt to visually erase any connection Croatia had with the 50 years of communism and 50 years of Yugoslavia. <clears throat> Almost all communist era monuments to World War II including the few monuments that mention specifically Jewish victims, were fully removed or partially destroyed, vandalized, or desecrated. Often, victims groups would put up a replica of the monument, only to see it disappear again, often within 24 hours. Some monuments were simply replaced. In place of a monument to anti-fascist struggle, a new monument to Croatia's War of Independence in the 90s would spring up. Out of 6,000 monuments memorializing World War II in Croatia, almost 3,000 monuments, including more than 700 that were of exquisite artistic and cultural value, were blown up with explosives, destroyed fully or in part in the post-independence decade between 1991 and 2000. Not only was no one prosecuted for the destruction of cultural property, but in many locations, it was the local chapter of the Croatian ruling political party, the Croatian Democratic Union, that organized the removal of the monuments. From the narrative perspective of the new Croatian state, the monuments to World War II had to be destroyed because they represented a symbol of a different future, a vision of an international and domestic order Croatia no longer wanted and found threatening 
to its new national identity. And while the public memory of the Holocaust and genocide committed in the independent state of Croatia was completely absent from the constitutive identity of the new state, a new public memory emerged that has since overtaken all other remembrance of World War II and began to be referred to as the Croatian Holocaust. This was the constructive memory of the massacre of Croatian soldiers. Most of them were retreating Ustasha, who refused to surrender at the end of the war, but also many members of their families, who had been killed by the Yugoslav communist partisans at the end of the war in May 1945 on the territories <coughs> of what is today Austria and Slovenia. The events of May 1945, which are called Bleiburg, confusingly, in Croatia, because the commemorations occur annually at Bleiburg, Austria, even though the actual killing took place in different locations. <clears throat> Since 1991, for the purposes of Croatia's new state identity building, began to be seen and commemorated as a communist assault on the entire Croatian nation. From the realm of unofficial diaspora commemorations, the Bleiburg ceremonies in post-Yugoslav Croatia became fully state-sanctioned. And the Croatian government designated the day of Bleiburg commemoration every May as a day of memory of Croatian victims in the struggle for freedom and independence everywhere. So this right here was the state power to redirect political memory. But this new remembrance was not a remembrance of just a massacre. It became a memory of the Holocaust, but with Croatia as victims and not as perpetrators. An early explicit use of the term the Holocaust or Bleiburg occurred at, a at the 50th anniversary of the events in 1905, when the Speaker of the Croatian Parliament addressed the assembly and called Bleiburg the Holocaust of Croatian martyrs. The appropriation of the Holocaust for Bleiburg specifically, and then for the larger Croatian historical suffering, has since become ubiquitous. The claim that Bleiburg was the Holocaust of Croatian Catholics has fully entered the Croatian public narrative and goes mostly unchallenged in the public sphere. The commemorations at Bleiburg, however, did not occur in an international vacuum. In fact, much of Croatia's contemporary memorialization follows the narrative framework offered in the 2008 EU Prague Declaration that I talked about. The declaration statement on two totalitarianisms is, re is referred to whenever a discussion arises about proper remembrance of Croatia's fascist legacies. At the 2011 Bleiburg commemoration, Andrea Hebron, who was then a member of the Croatian parliament said, quote, Bleiburg is the biggest symbol of Croatian suffering that equates fascism and communism. Communism becomes worse than fascism, it becomes the world's biggest evil because it turns into the system of killing everyone who thought different, end quote. And it is also not incidental that commemorations at Bleiburg have since become full-fledged neo-Nazi and neo-fascist gatherings, where old black uniforms and black flags of the World War II fascist Croatian militia are proudly displayed to increasing discomfort of Austria on which territory this event takes place, which may have its own issues <laughs> with remembering the Holocaust. But it is Yasinovs, the central location of the Holocaust in Croatia, the site where 85,000 Serbs, Jews, and Roma were killed in truly unspeakably gruesome ways, that continues to be the most significant and contested site of Holocaust remembrance in Croatia. There are almost no historical photographs of Yasinovs, as the Ustasha by the end of the war blew it up and destroyed all records, as the communist partisans were advancing. This photograph of a Jewish man forced to remove his ring right before being shot is a rare surviving photograph. Today, there are also no physical remains of the camp at all. Instead, there is this towering and quite beautiful flower memorial that was built in the 1960s during communist Yugoslavia. However, a new narrative has emerged in the past few years that claims that the story of Yasinovac was overblown 
and the entire death toll was fabricated by Yugoslav communists and later Serbian nationalist propaganda. This narrative has then further morphed into the claim that Yasinovac was in fact <coughs> not a fascist camp at all, but it was run by communists as a place of mass execution of Croatian patriots after the end of World War II. This narrative is promoted by established as well as revisionist historians, including a brand new research institute, which purpose is to determine the truth about the communist camp. A high profile recent revisionist push was the movie, Yasenovac, The Truth, which received official award by the city of Zagreb, the capital of Croatia. The film purports to show evidence that Yasenovac was in fact run by communists. The evidence for these claims is almost conical in its amateurish forgery. they are fake newspaper headlines, images of bodies turning up on the banks of the river, which is located upstream from the camp, photographs of apparently happy and content Serb and Jewish inmates, as if to show that nothing bad happened there during the war, which turned out to be photographs of a soccer team from 1978, and so on and so on. But no matter. This revisionism has become so mainstream and state-sponsored that in 2018, then Croatian president called for the creation of an international commission to determine the truth about the camp between 1941 and 45, but also after, she said, indicating that the narrative that Yasinovac was a communist camp after the war was now accepted at the top seat of power. Similarly, in the attempt to erase fascist crimes and use their imagery to represent real or imagined crimes of communism, at the site of Stara Gradiška camp, which was part of the Yasinovac complex of camps, uh, where also I should say my father was interned as a child, the Croatian government mounted a memorial plaque in 2011, memorializing political prisoners, victims of the communist regime, who perished in the Stara Gradiška prison on the occasion of August 23rd, day of commemoration of victims of the authoritarian and authoritarian regimes. And note the direct use of the EU resolution establishing August 23rd as the day of commemoration of victims of two authoritarian regimes. The use of the word prison and not camp is important because it directs remembrance to the pre-war and post-war period when the site was indeed used as a regular criminal prison, but not to the World War II era Ustasha death camp, where more than 12,000 Serbs, Jews, Roma, and other enemies of the independent state of Croatia, including a very high number of women and children were killed. Out of three memorial plaques placed at the site of Stara <clears throat> not a single one indicates that it was the major concentration camp during World War II. 200 meters away, however, there is this old monument to victims of fascism from 1941 to 1945, but it has since crumbled and it is in ruins, nobody bothering to repair it. All of this revisionism has happened not in spite, but as a result of EU's own practices of remembrance especially the reductionist interpretation of the 20th century as an era of two equal totalitarianisms, equal in their criminal nature. EU's youngest member, Croatia, was nothing but a quick study. So let me conclude. Why the Holocaust, why now? The memory of the Holocaust has been debated and revisited and debated again, and so why does all this still matter? My principal point that I wanna leave you with is, well, the historical and moral importance of Holocaust remembrance should be self-evident. Holocaust remembrance is also important for global politics. As my research documents, and as the events in Ukraine are reminding us every day, the move toward Holocaust appropriation across post-communist Europe indicates that there's a lot going on, both outside and under the European Union cloth. 
as the alarming turns to liberalism in so much of Eastern Europe show, Poland and Hungary are prime examples, joining the EU was not the end of history its architects imagined. And in fact, EU accession has allowed the states to embark on radical projects of Holocaust historical inversion. I'm going to show you a very offensive anti-Semitic ad, and I'll quickly take it off. So this is a cartoon in the Polish right-wing magazine that came out in 2018 that talks about what they refer to as the Holocaust, where allegedly Nazis collaborated with the communists, the Jews, to kill the Poles. And this type of historical inversion does tremendous violence to the historical record of World War II for very contemporary political purposes. So the question that motivated my research is simply how did we get here? What explains the need of so many post-communist East European states to revisit the Holocaust now, 75 years later, and control the way in which the Holocaust is remembered understood and interpreted. The argument that I made today is that these developments could best be understood as actions of profoundly ontologically insecure states. While scholars have analyzed domestic political machinations of various political structures, so right-wing and or populist political parties in particular, and ways in which they have instrumentalized Holocaust remembrance to make very specific domestic political gains, such as expanding the voter base or delegitimizing liberal opponents or mobilizing nationalism, I wanted to take a broader view. I explored how states use their power, especially their mnemonic power, power over political memory, when their sense of self, their identity was threatened by external political narratives that undermine the very basis of that identity. And as I have briefly shown today, as they pursue their post-communist new European identities, these states encountered an already solidified and codified political memory of the Holocaust, memory which just did not fit with their own understanding of World War II. The desire to become European, to finally rejoin the West then produced a particular type of Holocaust remembrance, which nominally followed the Western canon. Memorial days were instituted, museums were opened, memorials were built, textbooks were adopted. But in doing so, they used the existing narrative and visual imagery of the Holocaust to fight the real memory battle of delegitimizing and criminalizing communism. I hope to demonstrate ways in which post-communist states constructed a narrative about the past that bolsters their identity and self-esteem in the present. Practices of Holocaust remembrance I described are important for contemporary politics because they indicate that the basis of nation building after communism was ethnic and exclusionary. Well, this new identity construction may not be about the Jews or about the Holocaust at all, it comes from the place of exclusion of others, the non-existent Jews, but also the existent new others, refugees, migrants, or other ethnic minorities such as the Roma or Muslims. But most significantly and most global, the great delegitimation of communism that has swept Europe since 1991 has also produced a deep delegitimation of fascism, which is repackaged, retold, and reinterpreted to look more palatable and polite in the 21st century, as we're looking forward to the runoff <laughs> in the French elections. The great tragedy of the anti-communist moment is that it has weakened and made less imperative our collective anti-fascist moment, and we're now living the consequences. The Shoah, therefore, is not only East European past, it also continues to be its present. And with that, I thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Elena. Um, and so uh, I'll open the floor to questions um, from the audience. And again, those of you participating through Zoom, you can use Slido to post your questions, and I will read them uh, as they come on the screen today. Um, 
questions? Hi, Yelena. Thanks for a great talk. I'm Casey. I'm from the history department. So even though you gestured towards this at the end, it seems like the project you described, memorialization and erasure, kind of transcends partisan politics, ideologies, and also across, a, how should we say, um, and, uh, and all of the post-communist era, maybe 1990 to 2005 or so, when EU membership really began around the country. So I wonder if you could say a little bit more about parts of politics and maybe break up the time frame. In, I'm thinking of the Polish case most particularly, but in general, in those times. Yeah, right. So what I presented, of course, is a you know it's a it's a big brush view that right. that didn't go into detail into into political party constellations, but of course it matters. Um, uh, my objective was to uh, analyze what I discern would be a hegemonic national narrative that does cross party lines. Um, now, having said that, uh, I do find that these uh, hegemonic narratives that really provide the national legitimacy of post-communist states do uh, overcome division. They're broadly shared in society. They're broadly um, signaled by institutions such as the education institution, the media, the popular culture, and all that. However, there are political differences. And what I, and I talk about that in the book, actually in the Polish case, um, in some ways, the opposition to this kind of revisionism has become a symbolic project of the left. So that it also is not really about the Holocaust at all, but it's about projecting yourself as a good liberal. And so I talk, uh, I have a, my book is not about Poland, but I have a section where I talk about, for example, the, the phenomenon of a Jewish revival in Poland. And I'm more critical of that than some other scholars who have been more positive about that and talked about the construction of the Krakow uh, Jewish quarter and the you know, reopening of some synagogues and, and um, a practice of, for example, you know, Gentile Poles doing Jewish weddings in the absence of any Jews there is a kind of, we, we want to have, we want to bring this culture here. I, I find it more squeamish and more kind of cultural appropriatory-ish uh, than a lot of my European, they, you know, they say, it's just, and you Americans, you say everything is cultural appropriation. I'm like, yeah, but you're using, you're putting peyotes on you just, or you're, you know, it's just, it seems a little off, but, um, what is certainly the case is that uh, an embrace of Jewish heritage and more respectful understanding of the Holocaust has become part of a signifier of yourself as a young liberal. And to what extent is that a real reconstruction of the past and a real engagement with the uh, very problematic ways in which the Holocaust and Jewish-Polish relations is understood, and to what extent is it virtue signaling, I don't know. Um, but it has certainly become very polarizing. And so in the countries that I know better, in the Western Balkans, there's a very clear political uh, delineation, not, not so much in terms of political parties, because the left really doesn't exist in a lot of these countries, almost at all. I mean, it just doesn't, as a there's no political party on the left. That's, there's like a remnant of the communists but not a center left political party. So it's not, there's not that much movement on the political scene, but there's a big political division, for example, among historians. And so there would be dueling schools, historian schools and institutes that would be affiliated politically with the right or the left. So you can tell like in Serbia, you know, they're like up, they have like the same building, but they don't like, literally different floors. There's a right-wing institute and the left-wing institute. And they fight about the Holocaust and they're all communists and they're all of Serbian collaborationist regime and they publish competing books and it's gonna fight between them. So it's very easy to tell politically where they are, but it's not part of a political participation simply because the left has been, it's dissolved. Uh, in Poland, I would say there was a little bit of a kind of twinkle of this in the recent presidential elections, 
as the guy who was the mayor of Warsaw, who ran for president, he lost. He was on the more on the left, said that as one of his uh, pledges that he will support the restitution of Jewish property in Poland. And that did not go well because that's a huge, Poland has almost no restitution. In fact, they passed the law just last year that basically made it impossible to, to restitute any Jewish property. And that's a huge issue because so many Jews are from Poland, you know, there are all these grandkids, you know, from Sandy Springs who want to go to Lodge and, you know, be like, where, you know, it's my apartment. And uh, it's a, and so that, that became a little bit of a political issue that he, he lost. Um, Yeah, Peter. Hi, I'm Peter. I'm your father. Um, <laughs> Thanks for dressing up. As I said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I want to disentangle two kind of general claims or general statements you made. One is that there's this false equivalence between that is being created between the Holocaust and Stalinist. Um, problems as well. And, and I, I see that. Um, but I wonder, in talking about this project at, over the last few years, have you run into any sort of um, uh, kickback about that you're sounding like a communist apologist? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 you know, I say this to somebody on the left, um, yes. that the equivalence argument is bogus, but in their hand, we should be aware and not be confused as saying Stalin was great, you know, all these regimes were great. Yes. So can you speak to that? Yes. Like, how do you address, yes. and, and, and are you worried when you, like in your presentation like this, it would be easy to come away with that, that you're totally disregarding the, and I presume you're not, because I know you, <laughs> but I mean, what, what, would, what, how do you say in your writing, because I haven't read the book, uh, let's not forget that while they're not equivalent, I, I'm not suggesting. Yeah. That well, I, yeah. I, yes, I get the pushback. I, I, I didn't say that in the talk, and I, of course, don't believe that. Uh, I, my, my point is simply that they're horrible in very different ways. Right. And that, that, but the difference is very important. And what I am arguing against, against is the way in which the elevation of Stalinist crimes first is kind of historically inaccurate in terms of ele ele elevating it to the level elevating communist crimes to the level of fascist crimes is historically inaccurate in a couple of ways. First of all, it's geographically inaccurate because communism is different in many different parts of the world. So Yugoslav communism in the 1980s and Stalinism in the 1940s are of a completely in incommensurable character. And so this flattening does the service both to the more liberal versions of communism and, and late socialism and to the real horrors of the early Stalinist period. But that nuance doesn't exist in any of these. So that's first. It also, I think, is temp temporally inaccurate because even in the Soviet Union, the uh, different periods provided for different kinds of repression. And again, that is also flat. And again, you know, living in the Soviet Union or, or Soviet satellites in the 1970s and the 80s was quite different than in 1940s. All of that nuance is completely gone. Yeah. The most thorny issue, which is why this my project is you know goes against much of the historiography, especially like in the Baltic states. Is I I find the idea that Soviet occupation was genocide very problematic, mm -hmm. and this is how they refer to it. So when I put up the picture of a museum, it's not just the museum; it's the whole historiography calls Soviet calls incorporation of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia into the Soviet Union occupation. Okay. They also call it genocide. And the argument that they have is that this was a cultural genocide of Sovietization and remove, it's not like a physical genocide because they can't argue that, you know, there, were mass, there was mass extermination of the Baltics, of the Balts. But what they argue is that it was cultural genocide by crushing the, the, the national and cultural and linguistic identity. And I and then they and then they elevate and then they equate that to the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. That I find super problematic, and I have no problem arguing against that. Uh, but I think my main issue is simply that that these are very different kinds of regimes, and that the crimes that they have committed should be evaluated on their own terms. 
and that the conflation of one with another serves a very prescient political purpose, which I outline. That's but yes, there's almost always somebody from the Polish embassy, always named Piotr. <laughs> always <laughs> sits. <laughs> oh, this has happened to me Thanks. 15 times. Yes, that's exactly yeah. that's what I'm just saying. <laughs> and that person, I gave this talk in Ravensbrook at the you know the concentration camp. Oh. Um, and I gave something a different part of the book, but same kind of argument. And Piotr, God bless him, a cultural attache from Berlin, stood up <laughs> and said, you did a very bad job. <laughs> and I was just like, okay. Bear in mind, this Peter is only channeling Piotr. I know, but it's, it, there's always a Piotr. There's a chance to address the There's Piotr always, and I'm home. so glad that, that I, got, I got a Piotr today, too. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think we're going to turn to one sure. of our Zoom questions. So um, Patrick Bowen asks, what do you and your colleagues think of the parallels between this type of historical revisionism in Eastern European countries and the push by numerous groups in the United States to ban things like critical race theory? Oh, this is a little bit, little bit above my pay grade, but I'll, I'll try. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, I think historical revisionism and pursuing a flattering view of the national self is very important for state identity university. So to the extent that these countries that I study uh, project an image of the past of their own nation in exclusively flattering ways that they were always on the good side of history, they never did anything bad, they never collaborated with the bad guys, they were either heroes or victims. That's, that's the only options you have. Is very similar to the attempts to portray the American past as one of kind of glorious progression towards some universal human value uh, and the attempt to pose problems, criticize, uh, the open up to questioning is seen as not just anti-patriotic, but actually challenging the very legitimacy and kind of self-identity of the, of the nation. So in that sense, I think this is very similar. Revisionism is revisionism. <laughs> Frank. Uh, so uh, do you think some of the, uh, the pushback for accepting uh, a Western European narrative of the Holocaust uh, in Eastern Europe uh, stems from uh, nationalism uh, in these countries, or is it a deep-seated anti-Semitism uh, still pervaded the consciousness of, of individuals in that? If somebody, uh, for example, puts forth a uh, more Western uh, European narrative, that they are immediately seen as, oh, you are with the, the Jews. And this might, in fact, uh, dissuade people from, from uh, altering um, these exhibits and uh, monuments, et cetera. Yeah, this is a very good question. I have actually seen this. Again, so my book does deep cases of Yugoslavia, Serbia, Croatia, and then the Baltics, especially Lithuania. So those are the cases that I know the best. So when I was in Lithuania doing research, it's very common in Lithuanian historiography on the right to see World War II and the Holocaust, this, this, the historiography describes the Lithuanian view and the Jewish view. Now, the Jewish view is what we all read. <laughs> the Jewish view is that, you know, there was a Holocaust and Lithuanians killed Jews. That's the Jewish view. But they call it the Jewish view. So that answers your question right there. And so there's an additional complication in the Baltics case that doesn't really hold for the Yugoslav cases. And that is the role of Russia. So not only is this the Jewish view, they will say this is the Russian view. So they will say, well, Russia also says that we were collaborating with the Nazis. So then you're like, well, I, I don't want to be on the side of Russia, but you did collaborate with the Nazis. And so it's a, it's a very, it's all extremely politicized. So that's certainly in the way in which historiography is written. And, and in Lithuania, um, I'm going to show you if I, do I still have access to the thing? I'm going to show you a couple of pictures and tell you a little bit about what's going on in Lithuania on this particular issue. So in Lithuania, in 2000, <laughs> Okay. Okay, so this is, I mean, just to see some pictures, this is, um, so this is a horrible picture. I'll, I'll move quickly. This is a, um, a massacre in June 90, 1941, immediately upon arrival of uh, the Nazis. 
where these people are Lithuanians and they're clubbing Jews. Germans are just watching. Um, it's a horrible uh, uh, massacre. Um, and it's a, it's a very problematized question in Lithuanian uh, historiography because there's evidence that Lithuanians did so without German orders. And they, and but Lithuanian mainstream historiography says they were ordered to do this. Witness testimony says, no, they were not. So, okay. The second picture is um, a mass execution at Ponary. Uh, as I said in the talk, the Lithuania was ground zero for the Holocaust, but 95% of Jews uh, who lived there or found themselves as refugees from Poland and other places were annihilated. Most of them were killed in this site. This is a forest right outside. Uh, this is about 75,000 Jews. Um, this, these are some historical pictures. I just really, this is a picture in my book. I, uh, it's a picture that U.S. Holocaust Memorial uh, Museum let me use, but I just found it so painful to see. These are before and after. This is a picture of the same street in Vilna with the Jewish, Jewish life. And this is after, there was nobody there. This is just, there's not, there's nobody, there's, nobody survived. Um, I put it in my uh, in my book because I just found it so incredibly haunting. Um, and this, ex you know, there's like a gap there now, and a restaurant and a coffee shop, and it's 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 very very emotionally difficult, at least for me when I was writing this book, to go through all this and imagine what this looks like. But the 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 thing that I really wanted to show you. So in the Museum of Genocide, this is what it looks like. But that's not where I I want to show you this. So. Uh, Lithuania has not only used this idea that Soviet occupation was genocide, but they have also prosecuted Holocaust survivors who joined the Soviet partisans to fight the Nazis as war criminals because they participated in the genocide. So these two people are Holocaust survivors. The person on the left, it's Isaac Arad. I think he just very recently died. He's a historian, became a historian of the Holocaust, uh, was one of the first directors of Yad Vashem, very, very uh, established historian. And the person on the right is Rachel Margulis. She did die uh, a couple of years ago. She um, uh, became more of an, an amateur uh, Holocaust historian, but very important in establishing the Holocaust Museum in Lithuania. So they, both of them, escaped the ghetto. Um, one from Vilnius, one from Kovno, I believe, and fled to the forests. And as, as you know, I mean, the way to save yourself was either in hiding, but your best chance of survival was joining the resistance, really, joining the, the partisans. So they joined the Soviet partisans. And because in Lithuania, the occupation is considered genocide, they were charged in 2007 with the offense of war crime. Which is really, I mean, just wrap your head around that. I think there were 13. The fact that they survived alone is a miracle. And to put, and so Isakarad was already in Israel, but Rahel Margulis lived in Lithuania and she fled to Israel because she was afraid that she's gonna go to prison and she died in Israel without actually ever going back to her home. I mean, and she 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 wrote very movingly that you know she fled, she escaped the Nazis. And now she has to flee Lithuania in 2007 because she's a war criminal. I mean, this is kind of the absurdity of this equation where a communist regime with all its horrors becomes a unifying genocide that then these people get prosecuted for. So it's, it's, it's a very extreme view. Now I should say that the prosecution was dropped because international outcry was immense and quick and swift. But Rachel Margulis was too scared. She never, she never, she never went back to Lithuania, and she died. It's, it's kind of extraordinary, really, when you step back and think about it. Mm -hmm. I, I had the, sorry, uh, I had the occasion to visit the uh, Holocaust Memorial in Washington D.C., and I didn't perceive any of these equations. So I was Not wondering. Not in D.C., yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if yeah. finally to to remember these things. Mm -hmm. You have to put something outside mm -hmm. to avoid any kind of manipulation. Yeah, but that was kind of my point. My point, yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, the 
a visitor to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. has a very different understanding of the Holocaust than somebody who goes to the museum in Vilnius. Now, there are museums that are opening up or, or through House of Terror in Budapest, which is actually the worst of all. There are, I should be very uh, remiss if I didn't say, professional good museums in Eastern Europe. I certainly don't want to leave the impression they're not. But they're under attack. So again, in Poland, uh, the Pauline Museum, which is a really wonderful museum of the history of Polish Jews. It's not a Holocaust museum only. It's about the history and the importance of this huge Jewish population that lived in Poland. Um, was opened. It has an excellent exhibit. Everything was, you know, up to standard, as we would say. But it's become under tremendous political attack. The director was removed. And the, the peace, uh, peace and justice, the right wing government currently in Poland has put its own board that controls what is narrated. And uh, it's, it's, it's an institution that I'm not sure how it will survive. Already in Poland, there was a hostile takeover of a museum. There's a museum in Dansk, Poland. It was a museum of World War II. Again, done with extremely impressive international board standards, really good museum. And the government accused it of, uh, um, they call it, uh, I don't know how to say it in Polish, but in English, it's the uh, uh, pedagogy of shame. So they're teaching shameful history, pedagogy of, I don't know, I don't know how to say it in Polish. And so the government has removed the director, merged that museum with another museum and basically destroyed what's going on. Even in, in, in Lithuania, there is, um, a museum, I wonder where I put it, this one. This is a tiny, so this little house, greenhouse, is just a tiny little shack. That's the Holocaust Museum in Vilnius. It's a tiny, tiny little old thing. And the, this is how it looks on the inside. It, it's a, almost like a volunteer uh, kind of labor of love by a few Holocaust survivors, including Rachel Margulis. And it's, uh, it's, it's underfunded. I, when I went there, it was like 1 p.m. There was nobody there. They told me I was the first person that day. It's not something that a lot of people go to see. And then that afternoon, I went to the big museum of genocide, and it was packed with tourists. It was also packed with school buses, and the government brought in um, recruits, like military recruits, because it's part of kind of national indoctrination. So it's a, it's the, the the difference between the the state. Uh, budget allocations for something like this versus the other type of representation is quite stark. Yeah, so so you sketch the motivations, you know, identity-wise behind the, the creation of, of these sort of false equivalent narratives. But I wanted to ask about who were the actual agents behind behind creating them? Was it just a small number of people who who had the idea? Oh, let's let's make these narratives, or did it spring up independently in a bunch of different places? Like who actually came up with 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 this way of of presenting things? Yeah, I right. So I'll, I'll talk about the agents. I don't think anybody came up with it. I think first I'll say that, then I'll talk about specific agents. The, the, uh, this is a broadly shared social narrative that existed under communism, but was not public, but it was private. So this is what people talked about in their own homes, but they didn't really have an outlet to say that under the you know, communist regime where the narrative was very rigid. This was the communist narrative in a broad brushes. Everybody suffered under Nazism, under fascism. There were many victims, mostly Poles, but also some Jews, but not Jews any more than anybody else. There was no, uh, because the, 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 the communist identity was all, it was not about ethnicity. It was about this dedication to the socialist project. Ethnic differences were not something that you should talk about. So for example, in Yugoslavia, in the, actually quite late in the, in the 1980s, at some point, the, the, the Jewish community asked to put up a stamp, like a special postal stamp in memory of the Holocaust of Yugoslav Jews. And that was denied by the postal agency. Sorry, uh, which year was this again? In the 80s. In the 80s. Okay. In the 80s. 
And the denial said some, something along the lines, I have it in the book, everybody suffered in the war, not just the Jews. We do not put one ethnic group above the other. All lives matter. All lives matter. <laughs> that, that's exactly right. That's that, Yes. So they all lives mattered the Holocaust. That's absolutely right. And so, so this is, so, but, but the shared memory, the private memory is, was the one that, that was broadly shared that, that we suffer the most. So we, the Poles, we, the Serbs, we, the Croats, and we just can't kind of talk about it, but we suffer. So I think all that happened was that uh, the post-communist leadership, and, and in many of these countries, this was a nationalist kind of war to the right, anti-communist leadership that emerged after 1991, just harnessed this already existing popular narrative about our own suffering. And that what, why we suffer is because of 50 years of communism. And then these Americans come in and these Europeans come in and tell us that it's all about the Jewish suffering. Well, wait a minute, I suffered. My mother was put in prison by the communists and the Germans also killed my grandfather. And so what's up with all these Jews? And why do I have to talk about the Jews? There's no, where are the Jews? There's no Jews. Why? How about me? And how about my suffering? And how about, how about the story that my grandmother was deported to the Gulag? And there was this really a decentering. It was, it was almost like an imposition onto your own understanding of your past. Why are you talking about these other people? And oftentimes they would even say, yes, the Holocaust it was bad. Horrible things happened, but that's for Jews to talk about. Like they should talk about and have their own museums and deal with the Jewish things. This is not something I have to worry about. I want my suffering and my sacrifice and my pain under communism to be finally recognized. Mm -hmm. And that was the clash between that vision of 20th century and the vision that was being pushed by international agencies, by the EU, by the US to some extent. Too. Any other questions in the room? Yes. Aida, nice to see you. It was a great talk. Uh, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the Ukraine uh, war with yeah. litigations. You mentioned yeah. it a bit, and yeah. I have some ideas of how these parallels work, but I would love to hear you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about uh, yeah, the implications of the parallels of how the things will play out in the war. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, yes. Um, I, have a, I have a section in the conclusion about Ukraine and Russia. <laughs> where, and the book was written, I mean, it was published in 2019. I probably wrote that in 2017. Uh, and if I'd known, I would have written much more about it. Uh, but uh, I really didn't anticipate that we'd be in this historical moment that we are now. What I wrote about in the book is that there's a real, and I mentioned this a few minutes ago, there's a real kind of importance of Russia. The Ru Russia plays an important memory politics role in a lot of Eastern Europe. The closer you are to Russia, the more it is. So it's more important in the Baltics, less so when you go down, but it's very important in Ukraine. And that is simply put, Russian memory of World War II is unreformed from the communist period. They still talk about it as if it's the 1950s. So it's all anti-fascist, anti-Nazi struggle, the Nazis are just the enemies of Russia. So now it's, you know, Zelensky is the Nazi and Ukrainians are Nazis, but Nazis, like, it's very similar when you think about it to how the Germans constructed the Jews to be there. So the Jews, the Jews are the communists and the gays and the, you know, the disabled, they're the Jew, even if they're not the Jews. This is what Putin is doing with the Nazis. So they, it's a construction of your enemy, and that's now a Nazi, and for Germans, this was the, this was the Jew. Um, and so that, is, that has existed, this narrative that Russia has. I talk a little bit about in the book about how this unreformed communist narrative of uh, the Great Patriotic War exists in, in Russia. I use an example of a film that came out, a Russian film uh, called Sobibor, that came out in maybe 2018, I'm gonna say. So Sobibor was one of the uh, extermination death camps. And this movie came out very recently and it was Russia's contender for the Oscars. Didn't really get very far. Uh, and the, the film is about how there were these Jews in the extermination camp. And then this Soviet general comes in and saves everybody. 
and opens up the gates of Sobibor and they all flee and he saves them. I mean, and, and it's just, it's, of course that never happened, but the idea is, continues to be that it was the Soviet, it, it's kind of a glorification of the Red Army, giving almost the Red Army this like uncritical superpowers that they could almost end the Holocaust. It, it's really quite strange. And so that, that narrative is very alive in Russia. Um, I talk a little bit in the book about their, their, this is now we're getting, it's very complex, but there are a lot of Russian Jewish oligarchs close to Putin who want to put up Holocaust museums, but they have to kind of negotiate this. So there are some Holocaust museums in Russia that are also very problematic, that kind of portray the, you know, the Soviets as universal helpers. There's actually, it gets even more complicated because one of the big oligarchs, I think his name is Friedman, was very close to, he wanted to put a big Holocaust Memorial Museum in Moscow, but he's ultra-Orthodox. So he refused any pictures or images with women that were not presented as a Holocaust women who are not appropriately attired because they're making the Holocaust. I mean, it's just, it's all very strange. At the same time, Ukraine has its own very, very contentious relations between Ukrainians and Jews. Ukrainians did have uh, uh, troops allied with the Nazis. Uh, this is all true. Uh, it's a very complicated, it's similar as in the Baltics. Um, they also had um, anti-Semitic pogroms. Uh, by Ukrainians against the Jews, all of this is also true. And in some cruel and strange twist of history, this latest invasion may have done more for Jewish Ukrainian reconciliation than honestly anything in the 20th century. I mean, to, to tell a Ukrainian Holocaust survivor that Ukraine has a Jewish pro-Western president, it would be kind of un unimaginable. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a strange, twist of faith, I think, what's, what's happening now. And, and it's interesting, actually, when you listen to Zelensky, he gave a speech to uh, the Israeli parliament, to the Knesset, which was very problematic in some ways, because he, he comes from a Soviet understanding of the Holocaust. So he kept talking, it was like, yes, in the, in the Great Patriotic War, all these horrible, he had, he, he kept saying that his grandfather, was the victim of the Holocaust, but he was really a fighter for the Red Army. He had very little understanding of actually civilians. He, he, he went to school and he learned this. He's actually, his native language is Russian. He, he's from the Russian part. So he's indoctrinated by the Russian memory politics. And it was, the, 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 the members of the Knesset were like, what is he taught? That's not what happened in Ukraine. So it wasn't a very, from a historical perspective, didn't really connect with a lot of, uh, people. Uh, but it's a really, it's a, it's a really strange moment. Certainly everything that Russia, that Russia has been doing in terms of utilizing the Nazi tropes um, is straight out of this uh, understanding of the great patriotic war and the role of the Red Army. And all that. So um, this has been uh, really fascinating. I, uh, I was a little dispirited by this idea that in Poland, that the, the folks who actually contest this uh, view of the Holocaust are, uh, you know, you sort of describe them as, as urban liberals, yeah. westernized yeah. folks. And I can see how that uh, could fall into them sort of being identified with being anti-nationalist. So as I, I was thinking through a question that would be somewhere along the lines of, is there a way of being more honest about yeah, one's history yeah, yeah. in Croatia or in Lithuania while still not being perceived, while not yeah. falling into the sort of polarization between uh, the sort of westernized liberal left mm -hmm. uh, and, and folks who are nationalist? And most people are kind of, nat I mean, most yeah, people aren't yeah. comfortable with the idea of seeing some, some ambiguities in their national history. And then you start, I went, but I wonder if you sort of answered it with the example of Ukraine, which is a terrible way to, to, uh, to uh, redefine a national. Like, I suppose in Ukraine, what happens is, is that there's a new event that, that can be sort of the foundational event of Ukrainian mm -hmm. national history. 
uh, which is the invasion now. But I wonder, are any of these countries managing to figure out a way to, to be more honest about their history without yeah. falling into that, that sort of polarization? It is very, um, well, the short answer is, well, I, there's some countries I think that do a little bit better of incorporating the Jewish past and its importance than others. And I'll maybe say a little bit more about the Czech Republic, who I think does it a little bit better. But overall, it's extremely rare to see at the public institutional level um, a full reckoning with complicity with Nazism. All of these countries have Holocaust Museum, and they will tell you, you know, this is what happened. Again, I said, this is not Holocaust denial, but what they talk about is Auschwitz. They don't talk about what happened in Budapest. And this is almost universally the case. And, and then there are these like little nooks and crannies for so these little tiny, tiny old little museums where the Jews put up themselves their own history. But at a national level, it's all, like the, the responsibility has been removed onto Germany. And this is, we, we, so for example, there was, there is um, uh, uh, a, a move to put up a huge memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe in Zagreb, but it's to the murdered Jews of Europe, to the 6 million, not to the 35,000 who were killed right there in Zagreb. And so that's, it's just a very easy way to say, yeah, we're doing everything you're asking, which Holocaust, horrible thing but not about you know, what my grandfather did or what my regime did. So, so that, that's, and it's, it's because the, the, the pressures of nationalism and this, this comfort with the fact that East Europe is the geographic heart of the Holocaust. I mean, there's a reason why we're talking about Eastern Europe. Obviously many things happen in the West, we all know this, but the geographic heart, most people who were killed in the Holocaust were either from Eastern Europe or were killed in Eastern Europe and moved from the West. This is where, you know, there's a reason why they're called bloodlands. And to disentangle not only the individual or group or social complicity, but the social and economic benefit that these societies still reap. I mean, who do you think, you know, inherited all these like dental practices and psychiatric practices in Budapest and Prague? This is all morphed into the economy there are people who, uh, in political science, who have studied this. I have a colleague, Eugene Finkel, who's uh, published, he, he gave a talk here a couple of years ago, specifically looking at the economic impact, for example, uh, for villages outside of the Treblinka death camp, how the villagers would go in and dig up gold and teeth and all of that and sell it. And the closer you are to Treblinka, the better your house is because you had more money to put a better roof and then to send your kids to a better school. I mean, this is actual economic benefit that you have of genocide, <coughs> you personally as a, as a villager. So that, to disentangle that, and then to talk about issues of restitution, oh my God, that's so, I mentioned in Poland, but everywhere else, so much resisted because you, know, you have a house somewhere in Slovakia, it was a Jewish house, the Jews were killed, and the communists put in somebody else. Now somebody comes from Canada and says, this is my house after three generations, it's extremely difficult to disentangle. So these are issues that they don't necessarily want to really deal with. I, when I did research for this project and went all over the place, I found my personal, not generalized, but my personal experience of Holocaust representation in the Czech Republic, I found a little bit more uh, comprehensive. And what I found interesting in, in, in the Czech Republic is that there was a more, a bigger attempt to talk about the importance of the Jewish community for Czech culture um, and the importance of, you know, Kafka and, you know, and all of that, like, you know, like they kind of say, like, this is, this is what the Jews live in. They, they did a lot of cultural good for our little nation of Czechs. So, you know, that, there was more interest in talking about this kind of long history of relations, but in some ways it was easy for the Czech Republic because they can all just point to Germany. They don't have to deal with Slovakia has a much bigger problem because Slovakia, like Croatia, had a local uh, puppet state uh, run by the priest Josef Tiso and the pre the local Slovaks um, rounded up all the Jews and sent them to the east. So, so they again have a more difficult way of uh, dealing with this.
long answer to your question. We might have time for one more question. I feel like I could ask so many and we could keep talking forever, um, but maybe we should move this over to the next room where we should have some food set up and we can continue the conversation over there. So please join me in thanking. And yes, we can go ahead in the next room and continue the conversation Thank there more informally. Thank you, this was great. And thank you everyone over Zoom for being here with us. <laughs> <laughs>